Well, thank you all for being here today. I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Matt Griggs, uh, who, Matt, do you claim Jackson or Gadsden? I, I claim Mason Grove. Mason Grove, all right. From Mason Grove, right outside of Jackson, Tennessee. Happy that uh, Kelly joined us as well here. Uh, I asked Matt to talk a little bit about uh, testing biologicals and his use of poultry litter. These have been two things that have been pretty important to us in West Tennessee here in the past uh, uh, couple of years. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Tyson. Appreciate the invite today. Uh, really pleased to be able to be here and speak with you all day. And hopefully uh, y'all hopefully get a little something out of our experience. Uh, I'll, I'd like to try and keep this informal. If any point y'all got any questions during the presentation, just yell them out. I'll do my be best to answer them. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but uh, I definitely got a lot, lot of failures to build my experience on. Of, and I'm going to share, share some of them with you. All right, first of all, how many, how many producers we got in, the, in here today? I got, got a handful. All right, uh, this is a prime season that salesmen come by. How many of y'all are being approached from trying the latest and greatest biological guarantee to get you another three to five bushels an acre? Got a 100% return on investment. All right, so uh, hopefully we'll hopefully help open your eyes a little bit on how to deal with stuff like that. All right, remember back to college? I'm sure y'all have uh, seen this uh, soil triangle right here. Uh, this is what, what we know about, about the soil. You know, we got a really good uh, understanding on the physical side of the, the soil, the sand, silt, clay, compaction, all that. We know all about the chemical side of the soil, pH, fertility, all that, even though I've yet to have a soil scientist tell me exactly why when I add 50 pounds of potash to my soil, I don't get a 25 part per million raise in my soil test. Still haven't figured that out. But the third part of the soil, we think we know a lot about, but really we haven't even scratched the surface, the biological side of the soil. There's, and this is something I don't know that we will ever figure out. Uh, we can discover a lot of interactions and everything and how everything talks together and how everything works together. But that's something that I don't know if we will ever understand. But uh, to me, it's the last great frontier in agriculture that we need to unlock. Now looking at uh, just uh, biological products, uh, you know, they've been on a steady trend and know this slide's hard to see, but just in the next four years, the agricultural market for biologicals is predicted to, to double. Again, this is kind of like what we saw maybe 10 years ago with the foliar fertilizer craze. Uh, you know, everybody wants to jump in on it. Everybody wants to offer a product. Everybody wants to get you the next three to five bushel increase. But the key thing is when you're looking at biologicals, uh, don't assume your soil is already sterile. Don't ignore the existing biology in your soil. Uh, everything you do on your farm will impact the existing soil biology, whether it's good or whether it's bad. So before you're going to spend big bucks on biologicals, and let's face it, these biologicals are not cheap. I mean, we're talking 15 to $25 an acre for the vast majority of biologicals I've looked at before you decide to start investing that kind of money on a biological product. Uh, make sure you're minimizing your negative impact on your existing biology. If you look at this picture right here, the, that's a, just a clump of cover crops that I pulled up during the winter. I mean, look at all those different roots on there. We got rhizobia nodules on there from the clover. You know, this is good, healthy soil. So uh, if you don't have a good house for your biology to live in, uh, your bio, any type of uh, applied biological is probably not going to help you that much. But y'all don't want to hear about soil health. Y'all here to hear. Y'all are here to hear about if uh, actual biological products do work. And the answer, it depends. It depends on a lot, and it's going to change from my farm to your farm to your neighbor's farm to your neighbor's field across the road. It all depends. Now, over the course of the last three to four years, we've done a lot of work with biological products because I do think that there is a lot of promise in biologicals. I mean, the, the, the potential is unlimited on what it can do for uh, our productivity because, you know, for the last what, 25, 30 years, 
we kind of farmers have kind of been conditioned to farm out of a jug. All the solutions that you need for your farm will come out of a two and a half gallon plastic jug, you know, synthetic inputs. Whereas we're really not utilizing the potential in biology to really give us what we need to produce profitable and, and really sustainable crops. Because that, that's the new buzzword, sustainability. Uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of promise here that we can, that we can address with uh, with biological. But getting into the biological uh, products, uh, one of the big ones was uh, Utricia N made by uh, Corteva. They come to me with a product and wanted me to test it out and see see if it worked. And it's one of those uh, biological products of bacteria uh, that colonize the plant and uh, help the plant produce its own nitrogen. A real similar to uh, a Pivot Bio product, which I'm sure a lot of y'all heard about Pivot Bio. They've got a fantastic marketing team and they talked a lot of farmers into giving them a lot of money over over the last couple of years and what I saw very little results but Utricia Inn is another similar type of product that Corteva wanted me to test a few years ago and anyway in 2021 we tested out the product first uh, we put in a replicated trial with uh, varying nitrogen rates uh, our low nitrogen rate was 75 pounds per acre our high nitrogen rate was 180 pounds per acre uh, replicated them twice just to see if there was any level where this product will really shine to help the corn produce uh, produce nitrogen and initially I was really excited uh, you look there on the left is that's our uh, tissue test that we pulled mid-season and there was a clear increase in nitrogen concentration in the corn plant so I, I was really excited I'm like we're, we're going to finally be able to kick the fertilizer bucket and uh, you know start looking at biologicals to fertilize our crop However, when we came to harvest, it was a completely different story. The untreated uh, plots actually outyielded the treated plots by about one bushel an acre. Now, I doubt that that's I doubt that that's statistically different, but the, it was very clear that uh, this product did not make us any extra yield and did not make us any any extra product. But that's just one plot, one year, one field, one 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 farm. Re really kind of hard to take away a lot from that. We tried it again last year, uh, 2023. They actually wanted me to try it on some soybeans that year, but they gave me enough product to also try it on cotton and corn. So this is what we saw on corn. And again, uh, tissue test in season. We saw a clear response, greater nitrogen in the treated plots. But when it come to yield, uh, we, did see a, we did see a yield increase of about three bushels an acre. But uh, I'm not selling corn for $7 a bushel. It, it's not out there. And that's what it would have taken to actually pay for the cost of the product. We saw a little bit of yield increase, but we actually lost money by, by utilizing this product. But y'all didn't come to hear about corn. This is a cotton conference, so let's see what it does, does on, on cotton. Uh, we applied the uh, same product on, on cotton and uh, on tissue tests, we really didn't, we didn't see anything. We had... You know, sometimes the untreated was higher in tissue tests, sometimes the treated was higher in tissue tests, and we really didn't see anything. But this has never happened on a replicated plot to me before. The untreated and the treated had the exact same yield down to the, uh, what is it, one, one, one ten thousandth of a, of a pound per acre, the exact same yield. I actually sent the results to Tyson here, like, uh, is my math wrong? That, that, I guess I'm wrong with my spreadsheet, but come figure out exact same yield. So certainly didn't make any money off, off that. Now, over the course of years, we've done a, a bunch of other uh, tests with biologicals. Uh, last year, uh, we tried BioWake and corn. Inconsistent results there. One side by side showed no yield difference. The other side by side so showed 20 bushel increase. Might be something that we look at again uh, this year. Uh, Rutella, which is a, uh, it's a biological, but it's, it's a, it has to deal more with a mycorrhiza a fungus. Uh, and that's somewhere I think that we really need to be looking at. But I tried it in corn a few years ago. Didn't, it, it showed enough yield to maybe cover for the cost of the product. In soybeans, it actually showed a decrease in yield. And then I've tried a bunch of other biostimulants, which are basically products in a jug that uh, these companies say that the bacteria and what the microbes actually produce the actual su substances that, that they produce and basically you're cutting out the bacteria part to to get that part uh, to get that additive to stimulate the crop tried a bunch of them in my opinion at least on my farm they're snake oil
I've never seen anything out of it, and they're, they're not cheap. But why, why don't biologicals work consistently? I mean, we know that there's a lot of promise with uh, biology. Why, why are they, all these products, why are they not making us any, any kind of uh, profit? And I think that there's several, several different reasons. Uh, if you look at a lot of these biological products, the majority of them are made of bacteria. And our agricultural soils, due to our practices, are already bacteria dominant. In my opinion, we don't need more bacteria. We need more fungi in the soil. And if you look on the left-hand side here, this is a PLFA test we had pulled on our soils. And uh, no, really hard to see, but uh, right here, 47% of the total biomass in that PLFA sample is bacteria. Fungi, right at 2% of, the, of that biomass is fungi. So why are we adding more of these bacteria biological products when it's already a bacteria dominant environment? If you look out in the, the forest, the woods and everything, those soils are gonna be fungi dominant. And in my opinion, that's really what we need, especially the uh, arbuscular mycorrhiza because you think about mycorrhiza, their main function is they attach to plant roots to further how much how much uh, area of the soil that they cover to pull in moisture, nutrients, and everything else. Uh, Tyson, how, how, much of a, how much of the soil does an actual cotton roots plant actually contact? I mean, probably not even like a half of a percent. But if you got mycorrhizae in the soil that attach to the cotton plant, I mean, you greatly increase the network to bring in the nutrients. I have a hard time keeping uh, my potassium levels up in my cotton tissue test. And the reason is I don't have that network. Now we're a very big proponents of soil health, high biomass cover crops, been doing it for years. Uh, chicken litter, really trying to really build our soils up, especially the habitat for this biology. And even after all that, my soils are still testing poor. They're still testing bacteria dominant. And I'm trying to provide the uh, habitat and get them introduced in our soil. And I'm not having any luck. Still haven't quite figured out why. But once I unlock this mystery, there's no telling what our productivity could be. Then if you look right down here, the fungi to bacteria ratio, uh, it says 0 0.04. And then looking here on the uh, rating chart, anything below 0 0.05 is classified as very poor. This is a huge improvement we can make on our farm. I just haven't figured out how. I've tried several different- You do a lot of tillage, because a lot of times if you till a lot of your bacteria, is way higher than the fungi. Absolutely, zero tillage for zero tillage for over over 20 years. That doesn't make sense. Not not only that, but uh, we're talking about heavy biomass cover crops. We're talking about chicken manure application, and again, this is just this is only a few tests I pulled. I might have pulled them at the wrong time of year. I've heard somewhere that that pH can also affect bacteria fungi. Uh, Proportions. Uh, there, I'm sure that there's no no doubt about that. I don't exactly know what. Your higher pHs will allow for more bacterial dominant, and your lower pHs will give you know, the fungi a better chance. Yeah, and I, I don't exactly know the specific values. I know we keep our pH around 6.4 to 6.5. That that's what we shoot to keep them uh, maintained in our in our soil. So uh, again, I. You know, we tried several different things. I tried the Rutella product. It didn't show up in the PLFA samples. I've actually tried uh, uh, digging up uh, a soil out of the woods, putting it in a manure spreader, and spreading strips in the field to see if uh, I could see some results that way. And I did see some. So I'm trying to introduce uh, fungi to our fields, but something we're doing is either not allowing them to survive, it's definitely not allowing them to thrive. So that's more work, work, work that we, we've got to do. But if we're thinking about a biological product, think about you know, uh, uh, you know, six inches deep, one acre of land, you're talking about two million pounds of soil. How much biology bacteria is already living in that soil? And then you're applying on a product at a, a few ounces per acre. I mean, it's not even like putting a drop of water in a swimming pool, how much biology you're, you're actually adding to your field. My thinking is the key thing is though, if you build a habitat for the biology, the biology will come. Uh, going back to this previous slide, uh, one thing I want to point out, 
if you look at the total living microbial biomass, we're right there at 1,500 uh, on there. And then look at the rating, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 is, is considered average for our uh, microbial population. So we're doing our best to build a habitat, but we have, we're not quite excelling at building a habitat yet. But I firmly believe if you build, if you build the habitat for biology, it will come. Now, there's some different ways to uh, improve your biological habitat. You know, you got to provide a food source for the for the biology. You know, otherwise they're going they're going to starve. You need organic matter. Uh, you need manure. Uh, you know, you need living roots all year long to provide those exudates. I mean, you need multiple sources of food for the biology and the soil. Do things that quit hurting the biology and the soil. Uh, soil biology does not like high salt fertilizers and most of our synthetic fertilizers are high salt. Uh, absolutely no hand, anhyd anhydrous. If you want to sterilize your soil, apply an anhydrous. I know it's a cheap nitrogen source, but it's absolute hell on your, on your soil biology. Uh, you know, this is kind of a dirty word in some, some parts of the country, you know, but reduce or, or even better, eliminate tillage. You, you plow the ground up, you're destroying the habitat for, for the soil biology. You know, uh, build soil structure up through the use of, of cover crops. You know, uh, not only increase your water infiltration, but also increase the amount of air getting into the soil to support your uh, soil biology. Uh, if your farm needs it, you know, put some tile on it. Uh, biology does not like uh, saturated soils. But uh, y'all probably here, y'all probably here to hear, are there any biological products that work? I have found one that has consistently worked for me, surprisingly, and it's not one of those $15 to $25 in applications. It's a $4.60 per acre application. Uh, you know, the, the late Dave Brand, soil health guru, he actually put me on this biological for my cover crops a few years ago, and then uh, uh, to get my uh, clover to nodulate, had good success out of that. And then uh, just on a whim one year, we were planting corn. We got done with the University of Tennessee variety trials. I had some of this product in the back of my truck. Like, I'm going to put in a replicated plot. Didn't expect anything out of it. In fact, I forgot I even had it until we harvested the UT variety trial. And I saw some flags over there. Like, oh, I, got, I got this other plot over here. We'll, we'll go ahead and shell it. The results actually blew me away. I could not believe it. But anyway, this is a product that we used, a Micronoxida inoculant. It's sold by a company called Sono Ag. Uh, you go to sonoagfertilizer.com, you can read more about it. Now, I'm not sponsored by Micronoc. I'm not paid by them. I don't get any free product. I pay the same price y'all will pay. I'm just a firm believer in it. But it's a mixture of uh, Azotobacter, which is bacteria lives in the soil that uh, uh, it's, free, it's free living, doesn't require a host, but it takes atmospheric nitrogen, puts it in a plant available form. It's got uh, bacillus, you know, for your uh, uh, nodulating, uh, rhizomium, but it's also got mycorrhizal fungi in it, which I think is, uh, is definitely a, a big part of, of helping out. But anyway, after that first year uh, that we tried it out in those replicated plots, uh, I didn't go to using it full scale. I, I want to see more results out of it. We tested that product four years in a row, which is this slide right here. It was one of the mo most consistent things that I've ever tested on, on our farm. I could, I could be testing top yielding varieties and I don't think I would see this consistent of results. But anyway, over a four year period, the Micronoc treated corn out yielded the untreated by an average of around nine bushels per acre. And this is a $4.60 per acre product. Uh, but not only did it out yield it, it was also drier at harvest by almost a, a full percentage point, which uh, you want to get in the field, get your corn harvested, you know, that could be, be something real. But anyway, uh, over the course of four years on our replicated test, Micronoc won 71% uh, of the time of the untreated plot right beside it. Uh, very consistent and very pleased and low risk at only $4.60 per acre. And all it is, it's a dry product. And uh, when we pour our seed uh, in the hopper, we mix it in with it, mix it in real well. And uh, we've had, had really good luck out of it. But again, this is, a, this is a cotton conference. It's not a corn conference. So what's it do on cotton? Well, we tried it last year. Uh, before that, we had tried it on wheat and soybeans, did not see any uh, kind of uh, yield improvements on those crops, but we tried it last year on, on cotton. 
and uh, it performed well. Uh, you know, it beat uh, the untreated average by about uh, by what was that about, about sixty pounds an acre. A four dollar and sixty cent uh, application picked up about an extra sixty dollars per acre in income, and in, out of the uh, four replications we had, Micronoc won 100% of the time. Now, that doesn't mean I'm gonna do treat my whole cotton crop with it next year, but it means I'm gonna put in another replicated plot. And a huge thanks to UT for, uh, <coughs> weighing, for weighing the samples and also uh, ginning the samples to get me, back the, get, me back, get me back the data on it. My key to takeaway points on biologicals is I, I firmly believe that even though Everything I've shown you, biologicals don't necessarily work with what we've got now. I do think that there is a lot of promise and I think it's the last great frontier to unlock in, in the world of agriculture. But right now, biologicals are in their absolute infancy. We, like I said, we don't know hardly anything about it. I mean, all we know is what maybe some strains of bacteria do. People are putting them in a jug and saying, well, it should do this to your crop. We don't understand the interaction between all the different strains of bacteria. We don't understand the interaction of when we apply those bacteria or whatever else to the plants or what they do in the soil or how they're affected by the weather or how they're affected by you know what we apply on our crops. There's just so much we don't know, know about and it's really risky to you know, tie up uh, 15 to $25 an acre in that kind of a product. In fact, I could probably look at any of your farms and I could probably identify three or four different places where you would be better off investing 15 to $25 per acre that would give you a more consistent uh, return on investment. Now, when those salesmen do apply, uh, do approach you, and this is my reply to every single one of them, give me a little bit of the product so I can put in a replicated test. And if they really feel their product's worth something, they'll give you enough product to put in a replicated test and then test it yourself. And then test it again next year and then test it again the year after that. Make sure it's consistently going to do what you need it to do. And if they won't give you any product test, well, it pretty much tells you what, what you need to know about the product. They're not confident enough to actually pony up a little bit and give you enough for a replicated test. Don't even consider it again. In college, this point was uh, uh, this point was really beat into me. A certain product is only going to help you increase yield if it addresses whatever your most limiting factor is. Uh, these biologicals that we're applying, it might be addressing something in our crop production system, but it's not yet a limiting factor. There's other factors we've got to identify and eliminate first before that biological product might help us. So. You know, if it doesn't address a limiting factor, it's, it's really not going, not going to help you at all. But the, the key takeaway home point is before you even explore a biological, make sure you've got a good habitat for the biology whenever you do apply it. Well, that covers everything. Tyson, you got anything you want to add or? Yeah, I got a couple slides. We got some time right here for questions though. How was that micro knock seen? Uh, it was applied in the in the seed box. It's a dry dry product that uh, when we were adding seed to the box, we would add the Micronoc and manually stir it in to, to coat the seeds. They do make a liquid product that is more concentrated. So if you can apply uh, any products in furrow, you can do do it that way, and it would definitely be be, be a whole lot easier. I think it'd actually be a little bit cheaper too. The liquid's like temperature sensitive. Though, isn't it? Yeah, any biological is going to be sensitive to however it's stored sunlight moderate temperatures you definitely got to be, be be very careful and that Micronoc is manufactured by Sono Ag Fertilizer or Sono Ag you go to sonoagfertilizer.com you can see more more about it is that nutrition and infertile no that is applied uh, that is applied in in season uh, th through our sprayer you want to try to apply it to when you got good growing conditions because it's uh, it's absorbed into the plant through the stomata. So if it's hot and dry, you know, middle of the day, the stomata tend to close. That's something you want to apply, you know, early in the morning, maybe late at night. A lot of people actually recommend applying it at you know di during the night when you've got maximum open 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 stomata. That that's a that's a seed treatment. Uh, I think it's a seed treatment. I think it'll be applied in furrow too. So it, it it does kind of the same thing, but it's a completely different product in how it gets into the plant. Are you going to look at any rates of synthetic below the twenty? 
Are you going to look at any that's, that maybe no fertilizer, no synthetic? Yeah, I think down, down the road, you know, right now uh, for last five or six years, we've been typically applying around 40 pounds of synthetic nitrogen to our cotton, cotton crop because we're getting nitrogen from increased organic matter in our soils. We're getting nitrogen from the chicken litter, if I can get it, and we're also getting nitrogen from the cover crop. So uh, this year, if I've got good good cover crop, if I can apply chicken litter, I'm probably going back that down to 30 pounds over my whole crop and maybe do a, a few test strips where I just turn my turn my buggy off and don't fertilize at all, just, just see what you can do. Pretty good yields. Yeah, it, it, just, it goes to show you how much we're over applying nitrogen in, in cotton. We don't, that, we need to save money in cotton and I think that's the one way we can definitely save it. Pretty much no till. I'm 100 percent never till. Uh, uh, we quit all tillage. Uh, our, we did our last tillage in 2002, with the exception of like repairing a tree line or a or a, a rough part of the field. Well, we haven't done any tillage since two, 2002, and then we've been uh, we started experimenting cover crops in 2010, and then we started large scale cover crops in 2014. We planted green for the first time in 2015, and that's what we've been doing since. Do you expect to see any? Uh, the same results under different practices. Honestly, I don't, I don't know because there's so many, there's so many variables out there. And what I'm telling you has worked great for us on our farm. If you were to do the exact same thing that we do on your farm, your results could be totally different. What I tell everybody is, is start out small, try a little bit, uh, and and test, test, test on your own farm to find out what works for you because I can tell you what we do, but that don't mean you'll see, see, the, see the same results in your soils with your climate and, and farming practices. I'm gonna share a couple slides. I think that'll add, add to the conversation uh, in, the, in the time we have left. Dr. Brian Arnall uh, shared these slides with me after the uh, Beltwide conferences. Cotton Incorporated has been gracious enough to try to help us uh, address uh, some of the, well, I mean, we've just been inundated by all the new products from a biological standpoint. This is a map of the 2023 biologicals organized by product type, and, and I won't go through all of them, but we'll help me skip ahead. We've got growth regulators, post-harvest biopesticides, macrobials, biostimulants. And the interesting thing about this is, you know, several years ago, it was a mom and pop brewing homebrew in the garage shop. But if you look closely, you'll see Syngenta, there's Corteva, BASF, Helena. But we've got some Yara, you know, the largest uh, nitrogen producing company in the world. We've got big money now in these microbials. And, and I, I really do believe that there are some products in this map that absolutely are going to provide return on investment. But figuring out which ones they are is a real challenge and, and has been a real challenge for us. And I think this, this diagram does a, does a great job of, of demonstrating this. This is uh, information generated by Stratus Ag Research. They did a survey of retailers and, and this is a summary of that survey. I want to start with this big portion here, this big uh, green portion. 52% of U.S. retailers have a positive attitude about biostimulants. 23% of U.S. retailers have a negative attitude and 25% are unconvinced but might consider. So if you think about this, you think about retail and the products that retail sells, what would this map look like for fertilizer? It's 100%, right? Or let's 99%, right? I mean, this is, we are just beginning to understand how these products work and if they work. And, and as a result of that, the people that are selling them, half of them aren't sure there's value in them. Uh, and you can you split this even further down, you know, 20%. Uh, of those retailers believe the products are valuable. 32% don't really know if they're valuable or not, but they're open to recommending the products. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting diagram. If we break that down, if we focus just on the retailers that are actually selling the biologicals, and we ask them to rate the performance overall, if, if going from five to number one is you know poor, and then the, this uh, tan boxes don't know, if you look at all brands, 18% of those retailers said they would rate it as a five, 30% would say they would rate it as a four. So we've got just about 50% say good performance. The other 50% would rate performance at less than a three or simply don't know. Uh, we, are, we are, again, we're just trying to figure out 
uh, what's going on with these biologicals. We're at the very beginning of, I think, what will be, as you said, Matt, a very long journey. I, I want to point out Cotton Incorporated has provided some, some funding to help us begin to explore some of the products. We had a long list of products that we wanted to evaluate, about 50. We requested product, not support, product. And out of that list of 50, it pretty quickly dwindled down to, I believe, five is how many we ended up testing. Uh, we had multi-state location. This, uh, Dr. Tom Ducey is a soil microbiologist. I was very happy. He came to the Beltwide Conferences and he'll be speaking next week at the Cotton Focus event in Jackson. Uh, Dr. Ducey, has been look, he's, a, he's a soil microbiologist, works for USDA by training. We sent all of our products to him. You know, there may be 20, 30, 40 organisms in a jug, but we don't know are those organisms alive and at what concentration are are they even in the jug? A lot of these products are not regulated. One of the interesting points that he made, not to take too much thunder out of his presentation from next week, but some of these products have nematodes in them. Well, not necessarily the bad nematodes for us, but some of those nematodes in the very product that they're selling actually eat the other organisms that are in the product. So let's say everything's good and, and healthy. By the time that jug makes it to your farm, you may only end up with a very small portion of what what you're supposed to be buying. And at that point in time, just like Matt said, you're putting a very small drop of water in a massive swimming pool. I, I'm really tickled that Ducey's gonna join us next week. I think it'll be a, a really, really good presentation. And he does a very good job, not from a poultry standpoint, the antibiotics, but you know, we're spreading a lot of things in our soils that aren't necessarily good for human health. And, and, and he explores that a little bit too. So uh, we conducted this, uh, this uh, last year was the first year we did it. Uh, Dr. Brian Pirelisi shared these slides with me. Uh, at the Beltwide, uh, he had seven locations that he reported. We got 22 locations in all that we uh, evaluated. Uh, I'm gonna skip through these because I've got just a couple seconds left. Here, here would be those, it's actually six products we evaluated. Uh, this is my data. I'm gonna share my data first from a seed cotton per plot standpoint and then I'll show the, the overall data. Uh, we looked at a, a nitrogen rate response curve first, and then we tested all the products with 40 pounds applied. So I had zero pounds of nitrogen, 40, 80, 120, 160. So we got the response curve that you would typically see from a nitrogen standpoint. Then we drop all, uh, we drop all but 40 pounds out, and we apply 40 pounds of nitrogen with each one of the biological products. And guess what, when we test Compared to that 40 pound check, no significant difference whatsoever, right? I'm not saying that these products don't work. They didn't work for us in Jackson, Tennessee. Maybe it's because we hadn't built the house. We haven't, so other things may have been going on. Uh, but if we look at the overall data from the Beltwide study, and again, this is courtesy of Dr. Brian Pierlisi, it's structured a little different here. We've got zero pounds here on this side. We've got that 40 pound check here in the middle. Then we have the 80, the 120, and the 160. He or ordered these in uh, increasing yield. The, the, the main point I want to make out here, uh, obviously we increased yield up to that 120 pound rate. When we went to 160 pounds, we decreased yield. That would be the response you would typically expect. When we tested differences between all these biological products, look, do we have a little bit of a response from this one? Maybe, it's not significant, it's numerical. Uh, this was only seven locations. We've got 22 that will ultimately be compiled. But the general trend here is that return on investment is not very straightforward. Uh, so we're excited again that Cotton Incorporated is supporting it. This is just year one. I, I very much hope that this coming year the number of products we're evaluating will expand. Uh, but we had a hard time getting, getting companies to commit to providing product. And this will be my last slide. Uh, my null hypothesis as a researcher is uh, there's no significant difference between treated and untreated populations. That's how we're trained. There is no, and you have to reject the null. That's, that's the whole purpose of testing. Matt does a great job of doing replicated trials, and I, I would encourage you if you're evaluating products like this to consider doing something like that. But if you cannot, if you don't have the time to do that, at least get that jug and run strips out across the field. Don't split the field, just run strips out across the field. This is a grower not far from Jackson that had some questions about whether or not he was seeing compaction in his soils. He ran two strips of tillage out there in his field and just watched the yield monitor at the end of the year. 
That, to me, is the bare minimum. At least do that. Get yourself, build some confidence with the products before you agree to take on, you know, half your farm in a product that may not provide any return. One other thing I want to I want to point out here, a lot of the sales pitches have been, well, look, you know, maybe maybe you did agree to test it, but you, you dropped out, uh, let's say you reduced nitrogen or you reduced potassium or you reduced phosphorus and you applied that product and that was the test. You know, either either all inputs applied or you drop inputs and add their product in. That's not the best way to test. What I would encourage you to do is drop those products out, have that as a treatment, drop the products out, add the biological as a treatment, and then run your normal recommendation. Because what I think you'll find is a lot of times there's some margin there. We can, we can reduce inputs a little bit. Don't allow them to capitalize on that and sell the product uh, because of it. So anyway, that's all I've got. I'll share Dr. Brian Arnall's contact information. Uh, He's been doing a lot of this biological work, um, and then my contact information is there at the uh, was there at the bottom. So um, I think we are absolutely out of time. But thank you all so much for for sticking with us for this uh, last few sessions here.